the channel, I am here today with someone who I have the honor <clears throat> of interviewing, someone who has been in Bitcoin since the very beginning or close to the beginning and who self-describes himself as a Bitcoin maximalist, Mr. Fred Kruger, which is actually your real name. Yep. It is absolutely my real name. They used to call me the nightmare on Wall Street. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and you know, I did get a, actually a call from Howard Stern once on the trading floor. And he was like, we're calling this guy Fred Krueger. Is that really your name? So, yeah. Well, why, why did he call you during his show? Because of the because of the nightmare on Elm Street. You know, he was like, we found this guy. You know, he, we're going to call him right now. So, <laughs> it, 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 this was my life. You know, if there was a... If there was a serial killer named Amit, you know, you would uh, <laughs> you would have to deal with it. Yeah, no, I yeah, you'd, you'd have to deal with it. OK, before we get into Bitcoin real quick, just to give people uh, an, an, an intro to who you are, you have a mm -hmm. Stanford Ph.D. and yep. you've been working in markets for the better part of 30, 40 years. Can you kind of describe how you got into markets and, and why you are? Yeah, so I was one of the the first generation of quants on Wall Street. So basically. And, you know, the real first generation was, you know, actually Larry Fink, you know, and right, uh, right. and uh, Lou Ranieri. So in the early 80s, a bunch of kind of quants came in and and started kind of applying math models and, you know, quantitative stuff to uh, Wall Street. And I got in in, in the, the mid to late 80s. So 86 is when I kind of got involved. And uh, yeah, so. You know, and, uh, you know, I, I just had the perfect background for that, you know, so I had, you know, this PhD in math and statistics, you know, and, and so, um, you know, I, I could look at stuff and, and there wasn't a lot of quantitative guys doing that on Wall Street. Now there is, you know, right. You're, you're breaking in and out. I don't know if it's. I'm here. I'm here. Should be good. Now. Go. Yep. Should be good. Yep. So, 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 uh, because of the PhD in math, that allowed you to start using quant on the street. And, and as you said, you were one of the first people to actually apply math models to trading in a profitable way. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, this goes back to, you know, when options came out, nope, people were trading options, but they didn't have the Black Shoals options trading model. Right. 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 So, nobody had this concept of volatility. Right. That wasn't a word. I mean, it was just they heard, well, things are volatile, but nobody measured volatility. Nobody talked in terms of uh, statistical standard deviation or any of those kind of measures. And right. so, you know, basically that. That came out, I believe, in 80, 80, around 83. Uh, it might have been a little earlier, but, you know, so basically there was they're starting to have option pricing models. People started looking at you know, statistical models of how you would, how you would approach valuing fixed income instruments in particular, right? So you have, uh, so you'd have some kind of a random walk model, right? Which is in, in kind of, uh, in a discrete thing, it's like a brownie in motion. It jumps up, goes down, jumps up, goes down, et cetera. Right. Right. And that's sort of a mathematical model of, um, of an interest rate process, right? So, or or it could be a mathematical model of, of anything, soybeans, whatever, right? So you, and there's a continuous version of that, which is called a diffusion model. Right. Um, right. Anyway, so this stuff gets into some really hairy math called, you know, Ito calculus and, you know. But, but you understand very, all very that. graduate level stuff, you know, right. but, uh, but you can, you can, you know, you can drive stuff, you can prove stuff with it. Um, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I was one of the first people to do that. And I, you know, I'd like to think of myself as at the time, I probably was one of the best at, mm -hmm. at that in the world. You know, I, I did kind of, you know, when I was in my late twenties, you know, I, I was, you know, my, first of all, my brain was a lot smarter than what it is today. And, uh, you know, I was a very, very, very sharp guy, but I also had like just a massive amount of mathematical background in terms of statistics, processes, all this stuff. Right. So, you know, and, and the, the entire point was, can we turn this into an advantage for trading? Right. And so I was trading the account of the firm, 
Mm. Meaning, you know, the firm had, you know, flow trading where people were buying and selling the long bond or, you know, mortgage security. Somebody say, make me a market on this bond. You'd say, okay, you'd look at where the market was. You say, I, I offer you, you know, 31 at bid at 31 plus. And then somebody would say, okay, you, you now own a hundred million bonds. And then I try to get rid of them. Right. That's right. a flow trading, but we, we were just arming. So we were like looking for opportunities, looking for things that were unusual. And, you know, that kind of behavior is the same way I'm approaching something like Bitcoin right now. Right. Uh, real quick, before we get into Bitcoin, Reddit just IPO'd at 50 bucks. Uh, did you ever trade IPOs? Did you ever have to deal with that at the firm or? Uh, well, I, I've been in IPOs. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. I, I, I've, I've sold a company, a company called Vignette, which IPO'd in 1998. And, uh, you know, we had, uh, I think I had, had about 2% of the, the float of Vignette. Vignette ended up becoming the number one stock on NASDAQ wow. in 1998. So, so my 2% was at one point worth, I don't know, $100 million or something, like $200 million. It was really high. Then it sort of came down and crashed. But like, you know, I've gone through, I've gone through the whole IPO roadshow right. with Morgan Stanley. And so, yeah, I'm familiar with, I'm familiar with IPOs. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you are a, um, a PhD in math quant trader. You've taken a company public and now you're into Bitcoin. And originally when I saw your, your, um, yeah. your bio, I was like, this guy seems like a really smart guy and he's into Bitcoin. And it seems like the more people that I meet that are incredibly intelligent, intellectual, Bitcoin is what they gravitate to. So I'll start, I'll start the conversation here. When did you get into Bitcoin and what about it philosophically attracted you? To get deeper. Well, okay. So, I mean, I like a lot of people, I didn't take it seriously when I first got in. Right. So I got in early. Right. So I got in actually in 2013, but it was just, you know, I, I thought this thing was a joke, you know, I'll just buy a few of these things. It's, it's like complete joke. Right. It's like, you know, if it was, I was trading Furbies or something, you know, <laughs> I got on eBay. It, 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 it really seemed like this will never work. Um, and then I continue to be skeptical. I would say in 2017, I was convinced that, you know, other things were going to be the key thing. I, di I just didn't understand the uniqueness of Bitcoin at all. Um, and I think I really, it really, fig I figured out that Bitcoin is going to win in 2019. That's kind of when I, you know, it was just, and, you know, it's, I don't know what's, what it'll take for you or for anybody else, you know, uh, but it's always a personal thing with something it clicks. Yep. And uh, for me, it was, uh, I was at, I was in a uh, sort of a crypto retreat in Bermuda. And, um, you know, there's maybe about 50 people in this kind of retreat. It was very high end. And uh, I was invited to this by some people close to Galaxy, and they were doing a a bank in Bermuda. And one of their their, their guests was this guy Tom Lee from Fundstrat. Yeah, we know him. So I uh, I hung out with Tom for the better part of three days. You know, like breakfast, lunch, dinner. You know excursions on the water <laughs> and uh you know it's sort of like i was sort of like tom where where do you where do you and bitcoin is about five thousand i'm like where do you think uh where do you see this thing going and he's like fred a million <laughs> and i'm like excuse me what five it's five thousand right now you're saying a million he's like i'm saying a million and uh and you know i i, I listened to it and it stuck and it was and, and the thing that really kind of got me was his demographic argument, you know? So he makes this argument. He's like, Fred, the, the most important thing of any asset class is the demographics of the people buying it. Yep. So, you know, he said, look, you, you get the silent generation. Well, they're kind of the children of the depression, right? So they're like, 
they just saw their parents lose everything and they saw the Dust Bowl and John Steinway and, you know, and so they were so conservative that the only thing they trusted was gold, mm. right? And then you take the next generation, that's the boomers, right? Uh, well, first, then, then you have the great generation, then then you have the boomers, right? And then the uh, the boomers, they're more enthusiastic, right? Because now America has won the the war. They're the they're the children of the GIs who won the war, right? Right, right. And so now they're America's roaring back. We've got you know, we've got the the economy's doing great. Um, America's on top of the world. So they're like, let's own a piece of America. Let's buy the S and P five hundred, right? And then you have the next generation, which is Gen X. And Gen X technology is starting to make a big impact in their lives. So they're not interested in owning the S&P 500 so much anymore. They want to own tech stocks. They want to own Amazon. They want to own Netscape. They want to own Cisco at the time, right? They want to own a little later Google and Facebook, right? Yep. So again, you have this new asset class, these FANG stocks, right? And as soon as the the Gen X kind of becomes the dominant uh, demographic, which is in 2010, that's when FANG stocks start really going crazy. Right. Right. Because now all these guys have the money, right? They have the money. They're 40, 50 years old. And so they're going, they're starting to plow that money into the stuff that resonates for them. Right. So now you get now the Gen X class is, is aging and they're no longer the top most di- um, dominant class. The new dominant class is the millennials, mm. which is a bigger class in, in terms of the cohort. It's bigger than the Gen X. The Gen X was a small little cohort just for whatever reason, right? The boomers didn't quite have that many children. And, um, or they were late to having kids, or I don't know exactly what it, why the Gen X uh, is is smaller, but millennials is a very big class, right. right? And now millennials, they're not really interested in stocks at all. <laughs> they're inter- or they they look at them a little differently. They they're looking at a stock as something that they kind of flip on Robinhood. Correct. Right? Correct. You know, so you you you're now sort of seeing a different approach to assets, right? And for them, the most important thing is freedom. They want something that they can carry with them. They do not want to talk to a stockbroker or an investment advisor or a banker. And, you know, he made all these, he had all these uh, stories about like, they asked millennials, what do you prefer, going to your banker or going to the dentist? And the majority said dentist. Yeah. You know, we, we, the last thing I want to do is sit down with my Wells Fargo financial advisor, you know? So, so now you have this new class. And if you think about this new class of millennials, they've got quite a bit more to go. Right? So they're, they're starting to become wealthy. They are now the dominant class, but they're not, they're not going to lose their share to the Gen Z's for another, you know, 15 or I think 20 years. Right. Right. So, you know, I think you're a millennial. So, you know, you would be, you know, your generation has another 15, 20 years before you kind of, you know, pass the baton to the next generation. Right. And so, you know, this, um, this asset class of crypto, and I'm saying very broadly crypto, right, is the asset class for millennials. Now, with all those things together, you know, you know, you sort of go, okay, where could Bitcoin go if it becomes the dominant asset class? And he's he's sort of like, well, I could see it getting to a million dollars a coin. Right. So I put all that stuff together and I was like, yeah, uh, you definitely have something there that I have not considered. And I, I need to stop looking at this as a toy. And now I need to start, you know, writing some big money checks to it. And so I didn't get, I didn't get free Bitcoin like some people, you know, right. I, I paid for my Bitcoin, you know, I paid really good money, but you know, $5,000 a coin was, uh, you know, there's Bitcoin's never cheap, right? Even when right. it was a thousand dollars a coin, it wasn't cheap. It was like, wow, it's so expensive. It's a thousand. <laughs> so, 
people always keep on saying, well, you were so lucky to get it then. Well, it was, it was expensive back then, you know? And so, I, I'm sure that 10 years from now, they're going to be looking and they're like, how did you get involved at Bitcoin at 70,000? I mean, that's right. crazy, you know? So you, when you started writing checks to, to allocate some of your net worth to Bitcoin, for you, it was a, and correct me if I'm wrong, decision on, wait a second, this thing's going to go up. I've been thinking about it the wrong way. I need to buy more versus this kind of anarchy, libertarian type of rebel against the machine philosophy that a lot of people have when they buy Bitcoin. Which one was it for you when you really got into it? It's always been about number go up. So it's been about making money. A hundred percent. Okay, now, I like it. It, it. You know, it, and I sort of say, look, even if you're in it for the anarchy or whatever, you know, you're still in it for money because what you're, what you, even if you're, you're, and this is where I, you know, I, I, I will challenge some pure Bitcoiners, right? The number is important. The price of Bitcoin is important, not because you're going to spend your Bitcoin, you're going to sell your Bitcoin and buy fiat. That's not the case. What you're about to do is you're going to be able to spend, not sell your Bitcoin, but spend your Bitcoin, mm. you know, and you can, you can peel off a little bit of Bitcoin and it'll change your life. Right. You want to buy a house? Great. Peel off some Bitcoin, you know, want to buy a right. car, peel off some Bitcoin, you know? Uh, so, so the value of your Bitcoin makes a big difference. Uh, Bitcoin a million will be very different than Bitcoin 70,000 for me. Okay, so as a maximalist, a self-described maximalist, what does that mean? Like, do you have allocations of capital into equities and commodities? Yeah, or like, so, so you still have other investments. So what is Yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a crypto maximalist. I'm not an asset maximalist. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. so being a maximalist, does that just mean you think it is the best asset to own, essentially? Yeah, so what I, I think it's, it is the, it's sort of the, uh, you know, the apex predator of assets right now. You know, it, it is, there's never been anything like it. And there probably won't be anything like it for, for the length of that we're alive. Right. In my opinion. So I think it's a singularity. Um, it's, it's something that is so crazy that, um, that it's easy to, you know, it's one of these things that's so obvious, but it, but because it's so obvious, you completely, for, you completely miss it. Why is it obvious? Well, uh, he, it's obvious if you're a mathematician. Okay. Okay. So that's what start, I want to get to. Well, what is the mathematical case for Bitcoin? So the mathematical case for Bitcoin is this. It starts out in 2009, January. It takes a price in early 2010 with this pizza, uh, Bitcoin Pizza Day, mm -hmm. which is an exchange of two pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoin. Now, you know, let's just say on average, a pizza costs 20, 20 bucks. So that's $40 worth of pizza for 10,000 Bitcoin. That's a price of... 0. 0.004 dollars per bitcoin or a little less than half a penny per bitcoin right, right. that's our, sort of your first data point for price right now you know it starts trading then it starts trading on mount gox then it starts trading on exchanges and then it starts trading on coinbase and we have a complete price history now for 15 years roughly right Right. Now, if you look at those 15 years, it has gone up 10 million times from the pizza incident. So 10 to Not the power, 10 to the power eight. Okay. There is no other thing that we have price data for, which has gone up 10 to the power eight. Right. Ever. You know, and so, for example, Microsoft, when it went public, has gone up. 3,000 times. Uh, Apple, when it went public, has gone up 2,000 times. Um, the Nikkei stock market from 1950 to 1990, which was the best performing stock market of all times, went up 400 times. Mm. This is, Bitcoin went up 10 million times. 
okay, in 15 years. NVIDIA went up 3,000 times, like since, since its IPO. So my point is Bitcoin's different. It, it went up by seven orders of magnitude, right? Seven powers of 10. Right. Now, the crazy thing is you plot those price of Bitcoin against time and you plot it in log space. Right. A log is sort of the inverse of a power of 10. Right? Correct. Correct. Okay. Now, if you plot both the price of Bitcoin and the time since the Genesis block, it's important to plot both of them in log space. And you then just have the computer draw a regression through uh, that series. You will, you will see that it's a, it's a line. Hmm. It is a it is a perfect line. Wow. And it, it is a line with a standard deviation of 97. 97%. Now, if you I'm sorry, not, not standard deviation, a correlation factor of 97. And a standard deviation in log space of 0.3. So it's it's a line where the standard deviation is narrowing over time. It's very tightly packed around the line. The chance of you seeing a line over seven orders of magnitude is un it, n impossible to put to chance. It's not so possible. You're saying the significance of it being a straight line after it going up that much, 10 million times, yeah. that is very important for the history. Of yeah, so, you know, like there's certain... And, and, you know, ironic, it's not ironic, but it's it's not surprising that a physicist would have noticed it, right? Because if you're looking at data, like you normally look at your Bitcoin chart in trading view, right? You're sort of looking at, oh, it went up, it went down. Your, your vision of Bitcoin is this. This thing was really cheap a long time ago. Then there was 2017, that crashed. It went up 20 times, it crashed. Then we went up, then we went and we had this double peak, and then we were back, and now we're back. Right. And it sort of doesn't, you don't see a pattern there, right? Right. You don't right. see a line. You don't, it just feels like, well, there was a couple bubbles and now we're back maybe or, or not. We don't know. <laughs> Seems risky, you know? Right. Uh, if you look at it in log space, it, 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 it is so completely and utterly um, clear that and if you want we can we can take a look if you I want love to. to yeah I love to. so can you pull up my twitter yeah i got it right here and let's go to the there's a presentation by my friend steven perinode who's a uh an astrophysicist do you see it yeah that one let's go let's go to just yeah let's go just go to the first one and we can go back you that's go to one out of 12. Oh, okay got you, got you. go back to that Okay, so let's. I'll, I'll just walk you through this deck real quick because it's his deck, but I think it, he's done an amazing job of it, right? So this is Feynman, probably the top physicist of the world of the last 20th century, one of them anyways. Um, let's skip this. And next one, next one. There. Now, see this line? This line here is a power law. Do you see how tight it is? Mm. That is not random. You see, the price is going up in increments, but also time is moving logarithmically. And you're saying a, a line that is tight over time with something that's going up, even if it's volatile, that indicates a particular, uh, I guess you would argue, a pattern in that asset that can't be ignored. Yeah. It it is so not random. This is like stopping and sitting on top of the Empire State Building and dropping a quarter and having it land in a Dixie cup underneath. Wow. I mean, that's the kind of <laughs> you will not see that line. That line and and I understand that a lot of people haven't spent their life looking through statistical data. Right. But you're looking at this point here is 10 million times as much as the top point. Right. This this point here is a hundred thousand dollars. This point here is ten cents. I mean, right. 
This, right there is a million, one million X difference. And you will not get that kind of behavior in a random way. And this curve is drawn by the computer. It's drawn mathematically. It's not like, let's just, let's just plop this curve in there. No. So my point is, and let's keep on going now. So th this gives you an idea that something crazy is uh, happening there. Um, now, if you continue on, we can go through that, but I, 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 we don't even need to. But the, the main point is the math here is so compelling, right? It, it is way less random than you possibly think. Now, I would say probably under a thousand people understand that in the entire world, including all the Bitcoiners. They, they don't understand it. They just know they have this feeling that it went that is going up. They have this belief that it's, uh, you know, it's headed to the moon. If, I, if someone were to push back and say, yes, it is, it is likely not random. And that line is the tightest line they've ever seen. Could there be an argument that there is a greater fool theory and that over the past 15 years, people have just been buying it up to buy it up to buy it up, making that line really tight. But at the end of the day, people are just buying it for no kind of intrinsic reason other than they're greater fools than the other person. Three orders of magnitude, possibly. Eight orders of magnitude, no effing way. Mm. Not possible. It's not possible. I mean, there's a bigger chance that the U.S. turns into Argentina than that, that line starts automatically switching. It's almost it, religious in a sense. It's kind of spiritual, that line being as tight as it is. It, it, it is almost like an alien came down and plop, plop, put the data there. It is it is so incredibly not random. And um, if you go back to the presentation there, I'll just show you a few other graphs. Yeah, I'll put it other. Okay. If you just pull exactly where you were. Okay, go keep on. Kelly, we can skip to Kelly. Go back, go back. Okay, look at that one versus gold. <laughs> so the, the same line is true. Bitcoin versus gold. Bitcoin is killing gold. Also, according to this power law, right. R squared 0.85. A little, little worse, but, you know. My point is, Bitcoin is systematically destroying every asset out there. Okay? It's killing stocks. It's killing gold. It's killing real estate. And okay. it, it, it... Keep on going. A few other things. This is a... This is a sort of a more complicated model. Let's let's not work work on that one. Uh, keep on going. Yeah, there's one more there. This one, this one's kind of. This is another kind of very interesting thing, which which this sort of tells you. Really, um, it's all about hash power and security. So the key thing here is that the security of the Bitcoin network, which is its hash rate, right, is going up at T to the power 12. And actually the fit of the hash rate is even more tight than the fit of the price. Mm. This is incredible. I mean, I, I can't, you know, I'm just, you, you look at this stuff and it's uh, sort of like, you know, it, it is so incredibly, um, you know, for somebody who has mathematical background, you look at it and you're like, uh, just like aliens came down and built the pyramids. You know what I mean? That's that's the way it looks. Now, you know, we see stuff like this in power laws in nature, uh, in, in other things. Like if you plot, for example, the, um, the on one hand, the weight of an animal, and the other hand, the how much um, food the animal, how much energy the animal needs to survive. Right. So, for example, a human being requires about 100 watts of electricity per day to survive. So you basically use as much electricity as a light bulb. Right. Okay. Now, an elephant, okay, is, um, you know, maybe uh, it's it's like 100 times, it's like 100 times more bigger than, than you in weight. But it doesn't take 100 times more energy than you to use. It's more efficient than you. Right. So it's it turns out that it's it's uh in in log space it's it's three quarters is the slope. It's power 
is power of 75, uh, 0.75. So my point is, and you can look all the way down to a mouse and you look at every single animal like this. And again, it's one of these straight lines, even the insect, and it'll, you'll see this straight line. And if you look at this graph, you're like, how could that be? How could nature have this, this law between metabolic rate and mass? And how come everything is on a straight line? It's just in nature, power laws show up everywhere. It's just the universal fact of this world that we live in, that power laws are part of it. And in something like Bitcoin, where there's some, it's basically like a system that's moving towards a new system, right? So we have this new monetary system that's kind of slowly eating up the entire old system. Right. And it's eating it up according to a power law. And it, it will probably have finished chewing up the last bit of fiat in about 30 or 40 years. Well, so the, the, on the Nate, yeah. on the the idea of it not being random. So when you say that, my head immediately goes to, okay, there's 21 million of these things. They're scarce. They can't be printed. There's no central authority. Do those qualitative aspects speak to the power line being as tight as it is? Because they those things need to be in place in order for it to keep going up, which is why it's not random. Because when well, here's here's hand, what I think. I think a lot. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of danger in this word scarcity. Okay. Um, and 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 I think a lot of people have have sort of incorrect ideas around scarcity. And you know, the person who first found the pattern power law, and I, uh, this guy Giovanni, also uh, he's a astrophysicist. He he saw it in 2014. He he tried to get everybody interested in it all the way up through 2019, and it was he didn't he didn't succeed. And then uh, and then the stock to flow model came out, and right. everybody sort of glammed on that. And the reason they glammed on that is stock to flow was all about scarcity. And so, as a Bitcoin owner, you're you're like, okay, there's only 21 million of these things, right? So if I have 21 of them, I have one millionth of the su total supply. It's scarce, right. you know. So, right. so, so, you know, which is good. You know, it's 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 an understandable kind of phenomena. But thinking that the fact that every time we have a halvening, that automatically doubles the price, is not accurate. It it, it scarcity in that sense does not generate a price it doesn't account it doesn't account for all the price moves right and um i'm going to get go into that a little deeper which is if you look at stock to flow it exists for other things other than bitcoin so in particular it exists for gold right so in gold it takes 60 years worth of mining to mine out all the gold that exists today so we say that the stock to flow of gold is 60 Right. So if you you just went and mined new gold, it doubles the supply in 60 years. Right. 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 Now, you know, Bitcoin right now is roughly that. Right. So if 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 you could continue mining at the current rate of Bitcoin, which is 900 Bitcoin a day, you would get to the current supply in 60 years. Right. However, the supply is going to go down to 450 per day. And so the stock to flow of Bitcoin is going to jump to 100 and 20 uh, in a month, right. right? Now, it is not the case that the stock to flow of gold explains the price of gold, because the price of gold is all over the place. But the stock to flow of gold is very constant, right? It's been six, between 50 and 60 for the last 30, 40 years, right? right? It hasn't changed that much, right? However, the price of gold's gone up I, I bought gold at 300 back in 2000 and you know, then it's gone up to 1800 and then it went back down to 1100 and now it's back to 2100, you know? So the price of gold has been volatile. The stock to flow of gold has not been volatile and it's not the case that the stock to flow or the scarcity of Bitcoin is solely responsible for its value. Right. And you know, I think the best way to think about this is there's a lot of other characteristics of Bitcoin that make it valuable, right? Other than just it's scarce. 
There's the adoption of people, you know, the number of people using Bitcoin wallets, very important, right? Now there's the ETF. Before the ETF, there was the first exchange, Mt. Gox, to use to do Bitcoin. That was very important at the time, right? So you think all of these things outside of its scarcity leads to it not being random. Like, I guess my question is, why is it not random for that line to go the way it is? There has to be something qualitative about the asset that allows it. So it's it, so what is Bitcoin? So let's just ask ourselves, what is Bitcoin? Why is it so important? I think of it as the native currency of the Internet. That's I would say it's it, it's more than that. Okay. It's the future of money. Okay, you have a better definition than me. Okay. Um, what I'm just saying, it's it's more broad. Right now, it's sort of the currency of the internet. But I think it replaces all currency. Right. It kills the dollar. It kills the euro. It kills the yen. It kills central banking. It kills banking. Okay? It's a big deal. Don't stop with, it's a cool thing for internet currency. It's much bigger than that. Right. Every, all the wealth in the world is going to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the new currency for the human race. That's going to take us 40 years to get there. 30, 40 years. But I guarantee you, you may be around, I won't. But when 50 years from now, uh, people will not be using dollars. Okay, so let, let's unpack that because that is the central argument for why it's moved logarithmically so Well, I'm just saying it is it is a fundamental transformation. It's sort of like the industrial revolution. It's like the steam engine. It's like it but it's something that's so transformative to the human race that we are now finally moving into a decentralized version of money that can be stored that has four key advantages, right? Over everything else. Yeah, and before you say that, that's going to be my question. Why is it the future of currency? And can okay, so, so I would say there's the first. There's there's a bunch of criteria. There's four things I would say you want in a currency. Okay. Number one, you want it to be hard, right? So gold is hard. It's hard to it. it you can't counterfeit gold. You got to go find it. It's really hard to find. You know. Silver is a lot easier to find. You can you can go out and create a new silver mine and, and it, pretty easily, right? Gold people have been scouring this planet for, you know, 5,000 years. They, they, they know where all the gold is. They can't find new gold. Maybe they're going to find, you know, an extra percent per year of the gold that's out there. But they're, they're not going to find any new gold, right? Now, maybe they'll find some on some asteroid somewhere, right? That's always possible. Right. But, you know, it's, it's, it, it looks to be pretty scarce, right? So, so the difficult to make more of hardness is the first criteria. Okay. Gold, very hard. Bitcoin, also very hard. Bitcoin's a little bit even potentially a little bit harder right now than gold, but, you know, whatever. They're both sort of in the same, same general thing. The second thing, and this has really been useful in the 20th century, is... Fiat is the ability to move it around easily. Mm. Okay. Now, that wasn't so important in the 19th century or in the 18th century. Right. Because we didn't have we didn't have the telegram. The te yeah. right. We didn't have the telegraph, right? So, you know, and then the telephone and then the internet, right? But now we have fast communication. We can move things at the speed of light anywhere in the world, right? So you want something for this infrastructure that's movable. Gold, not movable. Mm. You know, fiat, very movable. I can wire money from my account to your account. Yeah, you'll get it. It's like, you know, it may be a day for you to get it, but it's still movable, right? right. Gold, yeah, you put it on a plane, put it on a ship, you know, wait a week, wait two weeks. Etc. So those are the first. Those are the most important things. The third thing is the ability to secure it very easily. The security right. of it, right? Uh, gold, terrible. You have to have like armed guards. Uh, you know, you have to ho have a you know vaults in Fort Knox. All this stuff to hold your gold. You know, 
uh, Bitcoin, you get 24 seed, seeds phrase, 24, 24 words. That's enough to hold your Bitcoin. Yep. You want to add some multi-sig, very easy, you know, very secure, you know. Nobody's going to get so you can make it so it's incredibly secure. So the security of Bitcoin, amazing. And security of, it's even more secure than, than I would say fiat, right? Yeah. Because um, fiat, you you may have it in your bank, but now you want to move it, you want to move it to another country. You can't take it with you. No, you can't. Right. So this that thing is, you know, sort of a resilience against governments confiscating it or banks confiscating it. So the self-sovereignty of Bitcoin, it's, it's an amazing thing that neither gold nor fiat have. And then the last thing Bitcoin has is it's auditable, right? Right, the blockchain. You can look at an address. You can see exactly how much Bitcoin's in the address. Somebody can sign that address. They can prove that they own it, right? So for these measures, it's really... It really is kind of the perfect money for the 21st century, right? And I'm convinced it will be the perfect money for the 21st century. It's just now it's we're in the process of adoption, right? And well, well know, if people don't adopt it, all the four metrics you named, they wouldn't matter if people don't use it, right? Right. So your belief is that people will realize these metrics are incredibly valuable and they will start to use it. And, uh, you know, the genius of Satoshi was that he, he, he had this viral loop that, that works even at very, very, very low parts of adoption, right? Because the genius of Bitcoin is he sort of said, get in early and you could become very, very rich, right? And, and so the temptation is, well, okay, Bitcoin's only at a dollar. But, you know, I'm looking at all this math and go, well, if I get in early and if it possibly works, it's, you know, it's, 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 my dollar is going to be fantastic. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be worth $10,000 someday. Now it's worth $70,000. You know? So if so, someone buys a stock at five bucks and they think one day it'll be 10 bucks, they have an incentive based on the cash flows of that business to see their money appreciate. Your argument is if someone wants to get into Bitcoin, their incentive is all the four things you laid out about why it's a new form of money. And that's the reason to just hold it. And, and, yes. Well, sort of. There's one other thing, which is you have a finite supply mathematically, right? Hmm. So because you have a finite supply mathematically, again, it, it, it wasn't at one point that expensive to own 1% of Bitcoin. When right. Satoshi left Bitcoin, the entire value of all Bitcoin's mind was $5 million. Right. You could own 1% of Bitcoin, including the final amount for a couple hundred grand. You know, you see what I'm saying? So, yeah. it, you know, it, 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 the economics of the game theory and, you know, you want to call them Ponzi-nomics or game theory or whatever you want to call it, right? But it was brilliant. Right. It's you have to kind of get the wheel started somehow. Right. And uh, he, you know, it's like social the, networks. Zucks had to hack the entire Harvard database to get people to use Facebook. in the beginning. Exactly. Uh, that's a that's a pretty good analogy. Right. Right. And, it, you know, Facebook worked because. You know, you invite your it's useful to you. So you invite your friends because then you're going to get more benefit out of it. Right. So you have an incentive to add more people to the network <laughs> because once you're enjoying it you want your friends to enjoy it so it just grows like a virus right and i think okay. bitcoin is also growing like a virus effectively where is bitcoin's price going this cycle mr kruger uh we're we're, we're done with cycles okay so well, i keep hearing that this is a cyclical bull cycle bear cycle what is your philosophy on how we should think about a cycle. I don't believe in cycles. So I think we've had three cycles so far um, that we're not, it's, I'm not completely convinced that they weren't just statistical an anomalies, right? I don't think that, I don't necessarily believe that we will have a four year cycle and that we're going to crash the year before the next happening. 
I think we could absolutely go 10 years and go up and down and mainly up for the next 10 years. I also think at some point we could drop for more than a year. We might be able to drop for three, four years, right? Right, right. Now, I think the adoption of Bitcoin will probably continue, uh, but I just I just don't think that, that the cycle matters that much anymore and, and the happening and the amount of supply right now it just doesn't matter relative to adoption by Wall Street. And it, it, it's no longer relevant. To give you an idea right now, uh, you know, BlackRock itself is buying, you know, several thousand Bitcoin per day, right? Yeah. Yep. The impact of uh, the happening is going to be 450 Bitcoin per day. 450, several thousand. And that's just BlackRock. And there's also Fidelity. There's other ones. So uh, I just think that, you know, it, it no longer really matters. Uh, the happening no longer really matters. Yeah, there, there'll be a little less minor selling, but I, I don't think it, I don't think that's going to be that important. And the next happening won't matter at all. So. So, do, do I mean, do you think this hundred, if there is a happening historically 12 to 18 months after there is a double, I mean, do you think 150? is possible given we got to 75? Uh, yeah, no, I, th care? I think we're probably going to go higher than that this year, but... Um, this year, we're going to go higher than 150. I would say. We have a good shot. And and the reason is, for, for you at least, from a supply perspective, that halving event, I guess speak to that. How important is that part of Bitcoin's code, that halving? And, and now with the ETFs in, do you think that just creates a, a massive supply shock for what this I don't. Is. I don't think the happening is important. I just doesn't matter to me. Okay. So I think there's certain things I think are not important. I don't think the happening is important. I don't think macro is important. I don't think the what the Fed does is important. Uh, I don't think none of that's important. I think we 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 just saw something that is very important, which is the ability of average people to buy Bitcoin in their stock portfolios correct that's hugely important to me and the only reason i'm kind of popular on twitter is i saw that back in december and i just got on twitter and i said guys like <laughs> you don't know me but i've been in this space for a while i got a lot of bitcoin but i also have been in finance for a while and i gotta tell you you're saying that this is not important you guys are completely wrong right it's gonna be incredible like the I literally predicted like the only thing you're going to be talking about is ETF flows in about three months. And that's all we're talking about now is ETF flows. So it, it was very clear to me and just having dealt with wallets and self custody and all the rest, like, you know, this is, this is going to be the breakthrough, right? Having this stuff be, you know, as easy as just clicking two buttons on your Schwab account. This is the breakthrough. Now we don't we don't have we don't need any more breakthroughs at this point. This is it. Or this is the main breakthrough. Do you think companies will start allocating a portion of their excess cash into these ETFs? I think it it's going to take a while. Um, I don't think that's likely. That's not the most important thing, right? Most important thing is just retail buying Bitcoin. That's really what it is, right? Mm -hmm. It's retail first. That's just mom and pop general guys who didn't buy Bitcoin before, who now you're talking to some guy at a bar and the guy's like, yeah, I bought some of this uh, Fidelity, you know, in my Fidelity account, my IRA. That's the most important thing, right? If you go back to the dot-com kind of boom in 2000, it's, you got a, a random, and again, it was these Gen Xers, right? A random amount of people, they were just like, yeah, dot com. Yeah, I'm buy, buying some CNET. I'm getting myself some Cisco, you know? Like, yeah. Like, that's what it is. It's retail, okay? Second to that, after retail, the next thing is advisors, right? So you got all these guys advising people with big money. And they basically are like, yeah, I recommend you put like 2% of your money into Bitcoin. Right. These guys are... These guys are slow, they're conservative, but they don't want to completely miss out either. So they're going to basically say one, 2%, great, you know, and they're going to say, 
for there's all kind of reasons why they they think they're going to be smart by doing that, right? So, and then you know, then you get like companies like you know Apple buying Bitcoin, but you know they're probably not they're gonna, probably going to wait ten years to do that. Like right. so, I think that these other people are going to come way before them. And you know, then I think you will start seeing in the next couple of years, you're going to start seeing some sovereign nations. Sorry. How do you how do you feel about Michael Saylor and his strategy of uh, raising convertible debt, collateralizing MicroStrategy stock, and then diluting shareholders once he has to pay back the debt, which means he never has to actually pay the debt in fiat because he just uses the stock to collateralize the Bitcoin purchases? I mean, it's brilliant. You know, it's like, you know, he, Michael Saylor figured it out. And everybody can figure it out, but Michael Saylor took had enough conviction to put everything online. Everything online. Yeah, you know, the whole company. And that's, you know, you know, I don't even have that level of conviction. I have a lot of conviction on Bitcoin. A lot. I don't have that level of conviction. You know, I I do you know, back in the back of my mind, there's like yeah, the government could shut it down. Maybe I don't, I don't know. I I don't think it's likely, but you know, I don't really want to. You know, I'm living a pretty nice life right now, and I I don't need to go from you know, sixty five percent allocation to Bitcoin to a hundred percent. No need. You know what I mean? Even if I'm completely wrong on my sixty five, I'm even if that goes to zero, I'm an incredibly rich man. So <laughs> I. I I don't, I don't need. Wait, how how rich are you? Are you just like I've got fuck you money? I I don't need to talk to anyone. Type of rich is that the type? Yeah, of rich I mean, look, I I made my first. I I gave, I became rich in nineteen uh, ninety two. I mean, you know, like I, so that's the company that went public, right? That's what. No, yeah. that that's like I'm trading on Wall Street. Oh, okay. Okay, so I, I I don't know. I've sold ten companies. I've sold. 10 companies for a total of $500 million. Oh, so you That's bought before like crypto, money. before I discovered crypto. So you I know I didn't, money I money. didn't keep all that 500 million, <laughs> but me and my investors made $500 million. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so I'm pr pr pretty wealthy. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, there's, there's people that we both know together who are wealthier than me, a lot wealthier, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> Nobody's nobody's going to uh, you know. No one's going to fuck with you. So does that no also fuck with you. does that also give you some security to to like Michael Saylor also an incredibly wealthy man. He bet the whole company on it. Do you think someone who has generated wealth like yourself is more willing to look at these riskier assets versus someone trying to chase wealth getting into Bitcoin? Because you no, I think it's exactly the opposite. The more wealthy you are, the more you don't want to lose it. Ah, uh, that's a good point. That's a very good point. So I think most people who have who have money, they're into capital preservation, not capital allocation. Right. So n all my friends on Wall Street, they have, they're at like two percent Bitcoin, if any. You know. But 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 to you, a money market fund is like is like garbage. No, I I, I have. Look, I'm very barbelly, so I I think it's great to have a, tons of money in mar money market, and then to have tons of stuff like Bitcoin or Nvidia. Okay, mm -hmm. like I'm barbell. Like I have no problem holding cash. In fact, right now cash is great. You get five percent, whatever. It's it's not terrible. It's right. growing faster than inflation. Inflation is at two percent, but Bitcoin's growing at a roughly forty three percent right now. That's like the the power law model is equivalent to 43% growth. Do you believe the Fed at all when they say inflation's at 3% or, or do you think they're lying and it's part of the scheme of of fiat? I mean, I think inflation's lower than 3% right now. I think it's 2%. Okay. So, I mean, I I follow like true inflation pretty religiously. I, I look at this stuff. Uh what's I don't think we have an inflation problem right now. Well, that's really interesting. Don't. That's interesting because most Bitcoin maxis think that we're in hyperinflation, like Jack Dorsey, and that Bitcoin is They're a solution. crazy. Okay, so what? What? Why, why do you disagree with the other Bitcoin maximalists that believe inflation is too much well, of an issue? We don't have inflation. 
I mean, we, we really don't. We've had inflation's been, we've had inflation for about two years between 19, 20, 2021 and 2023, maybe. But overall, that's not inflation. We have a lot of asset inflation. Right. But that's not inflation, right? That's asset inflation, right? And right. it's it, it, by confusing those two is very, you know, it. you could say there's inflation in houses on, uh, you know, in Palm Beach. They're going up. Well, I don't, that's not inflation for me. Right. That's just an asset that's going up in price. Right. You know, right. now, you know, Bitcoin's an asset that's going up in price more than houses in Palm Beach. Right. So <laughs> Bitcoin is going up is a better asset to own. And yes, there is asset inflation in Bitcoin, too. And so it's a it's a um, it's a useful, uh, you know, but I, I that's not what I I think that, that I don't buy that whole idea that it's just purely, you know, inflation. And by the way, nobody puts their money in cash anyways. They have it in various other assets. So, so you know, if you have any kind of wealth at all, you have a house, you have stocks, you have other things. How many people have more than 10% of their money in cash? I, I don't know anybody who does, really. So you don't think Bitcoin's really a hedge against inflation then? I mean, you don't care. Not at all. Wow, that's so interesting. You don't care about it from that perspective. I have no interest at all in inflation. I don't think it's important. I think Bitcoin is a new form of money that's getting adopted. And um, and it's uh, and, and that growth to the new form of money is what makes it valuable. It's not has nothing to do with inflation. Inflation, we could be in a deflationary environment and Bitcoin would be worth more. Right. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It is. It literally is a new form of money. That's it. What is your perspective on all the alternative coins, the kind of dog coins that are popping up, going up a thousand X in like a couple of weeks? Is that too much speculation in the system? I don't think it matters. Uh, they're just, they're bad investments. They won't, there's only one Bitcoin. Uh, it, it's sort of, you know, there's a fair amount of noise with other coins, but mm. they, I'm, I really believe that only Bitcoin is going to have this extraordinary rate of return, even going forward. I don't think, I think everything else will, it may not go to zero, but it's just going to underperform Bitcoin. And Ethereum, Solana, things that are very popular as well. These things are not Bitcoin to you at the end of the day. Yeah, they're just, I think that, that very likely that those things will actually go down in price while Bitcoin actually goes up in price. Huh. So I, I think they're just going to be terrible investments. Um, and it's sort of like this. I think if you go back to when Microsoft became the top software company, Microsoft went public in like 1986. Right. Okay. There was other software companies at the time, you know, that were cheaper, that, you know, that did this, they did that. How many of those companies exist today? Yeah. Not zero, yeah. right? Um, Amazon, you know, how many competitor? What's the next competitor behind Amazon? I mean, what? Just try to name not, it. No, there's none. There's on the e-commerce front, nobody. No, I mean, I mean, Walmart.com, Walmart. maybe. You know, <laughs> like you know, <laughs> you know, um, you know. How about search engines? When's the last time you used a search engine other than Google? Yeah. Yeah. Right. There, there really isn't any. Right. Right. You know, um, how about social media companies? You know, now you got one TikTok, Right. Yeah. But but basically everything else is Facebook. Yep. Right. Yep. Uh, but my point is what we're seeing in tech in general is winner take all. Right. Correct. And so it really is a terrible idea not to bet on the winner. Once the winner has been determined, you just stay stay with the winner. I love it. Fred, thank you for being here on the channel. I have one final question for you. Uh, I've got Fred's YouTube in the chat in the description. Please make sure to subscribe to him on YouTube. Last question for you, Fred. When do you sell? Do you kind of hold this? Do you give it to your grandkids? Or do you have a price where you're like, you know what? 
I'm up a lot of money. I'm going to take my profits. So what I recommend is not when do you sell, but when do you spend? Mm. Okay. Meaning using so, it as a currency. No, just use it to buy stuff, you right. know? Right, right. So yeah, you, you want, look, we're here to, we're, we're put on this planet to enjoy our money. I have, I like to spend my money. And you've got yeah. a lot of it and we know. And, and look, I, you know, I, I do stupid stuff with my money. I own a castle in France. Yeah. Do you have a crypto punk behind you? I don't want to comment on that, <laughs> but, uh, okay. But look, I, you know, listen, listen, I, I've got, I've got some stuff. Okay. And, um, I think the point of living is to spend the point of accumulating money is to spend money. Right. So even Warren Buffett doesn't fly commercial, you know, yeah. he, he flies net jets. Okay. So, you know, listen, I think, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's good to think of spending your Bitcoin, not selling your Bitcoin. And when do you spend your Bitcoin? Well, if it's going up 20 X, you probably don't want to spend it in the next decade so much. Right. Good point. Yeah. But you know, at a million dollars of Bitcoin, Anybody who wants to buy himself a Lambo or a Ferrari or whatever the whatever it is that you like, you know, a house in Miami, whatever you want to do, go for it. I think it's like it's a great idea. Spend your money, buy art, buy do, do whatever you want. You know, it's uh, that's what that's what this is for. It's for spending. So think about well, it you is, don't want to have the regret that you're buying a pizza and the thing keeps going up and up so you're being we're, we're beyond the pizza stage already right right, right. We're, we're beyond the pizza stage uh, look we don't have 10 million texts to go we might have 100x to go or a little bit more than 100x but 100x is enormous it's life changing right it's not bad you know man. if you're if you're relatively young you're probably going to see 100x if if you play your cards right right and, you know, I screwed up on a few things like Microsoft. I could have made a thousand X on Microsoft. Mm -hmm. I had money when Microsoft went public. You know, I could have bought. I did own Microsoft on and off. Apple. You see these things in life. And yet, as the hard thing is not identifying them. The hard thing is actually sticking with it. Right. That's the hard thing. Right. So right. it's pretty clear. There's Bitcoin. It's a great thing. It's the winner. Now the question is, you just got, you don't have to go all in. You just have to stick with it. That's the only thing you need to do. And just don't think, think about it too much. So that's what I, I would it. say. And then, you know, keep your stack, hold on to it. When it gets really, when your bags get really, you know, valuable, <laughs> start selling your bags. <laughs> I love it. All right. Thank I'm you, it. Fred, so much. Thank my you. really appreciates it. Thank I you really, guys. I really appreciated the convo too. Thanks a lot. All right. See, see you guys in the next right. one. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Goodbye.